Hi, I'm Dr. R.J. Burr of Reach Rehab and Chiropractic Performance Center. I'm here today with Dr. Arthi Sura. She's a functional medicine practitioner um, at NB Wellness, correct? Yeah, Natural Balance. Yep, Natural, ba natural mm -hmm. Balance Wellness. And uh, she's on today because we're going to talk and probably going to do quite a few of these because uh, Dr. Sura has a wealth of information that's very useful to a lot of people that don't may not realize they need it. Um, so we'll keep it really simple today since we're doing more of these. And um, so my question to you is, I, I'm not sure you see this many people that are under a lot of stress, but uh, <laughs> I see quite a bit of people that are dealing with some stress. I think we're all stressed out probably. It's an easy thing to, to, to say. And what I find with uh, you know, back pain, neck pain, musculoskeletal injuries is that pain or stress can be a limiting factor with recovery or it can sort of put fuel on the fire. It can make something that's maybe a mild pain a lot worse than it really is and make people a lot more sensitive. Um, I was hoping you could discuss with our, our audience of maybe why that happens, how it happens, and then maybe a couple tips that people could do to help them with this other than, well, stop being so stressed. Sure, yeah, which is like, the worst advice because it's like you, you don't know how to do it right, right. there's yeah. you know we haven't been taught that as a society so i think you know one of the biggest problems is that we've normalized stress so people don't realize that we're actually a lot more stressed than we think but um so stress like you know it's such a broad category but it does break down pretty much you go from head to toe every aspect you know is untouched by stress like it will uh, oh, that is not touched by stress. Like it will affect every single organ, every single hormone, neurotransmitter, you name it, will be affected by stress. So I think one of the big things that people don't realize is that to us, it's kind of this intangible concept almost. But when you actually break it down and see what stress does, the hormone that goes up during times of stress is called cortisol. And cortisol comes out of what we call the adrenal glands, which are located above the kidney. And they're part of what's called the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal system. And these are all um, glands in from the brain to the body that talk to each other. Now, if that system is under stress for a period of time, we're meant to deal with stress, but only for short periods of time, not long periods of time, like running away from a tiger. <laughs> so, <laughs> right, you know, we're still wired like our ancestors, which I think people don't realize. And in today's modern day society, we have stress from all different angles, you know, just financial stress, uh, even relationship stress, the like just constant need to be busy. And right now a pandemic, you know, there's a lot of stress going on right now, which is impacting sleep, hormones, neurotransmitters, uh, like digestion, everything. So the big thing with people who have pain um, which, you know, they're coming to see you for, yes, part of it is definitely physical, but part of it is also neurochemical. And so when you kind of put the pathways together, the cortisol, the hormone that goes, goes up during times of stress, dysregulates what we call the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal system. It should work as a symphony, but if it goes on for long periods of time, it starts to mess up essentially. So here's where hormonal imbalance comes. And that's not just for women, it's for okay. men as well. Yeah. I think, you know, in our society, we always just say hormonal imbalance, we attribute it to women. Yeah. It is for men as well. And that can show up as sugar cravings, salt cravings, uh, pain, uh, frequent urination, you know, low libido, hair loss, you name it, any sort of symptom, fatigue, you know, all that can be attributed, you know, to the dysregulation of this. Now, what a lot of people don't know when it comes to neurotransmitters, these are the neurochemicals that help you feel good in your body, that help you actually filter through pain, that, you know, some things that wouldn't cause someone else pain can cause you pain because you just are depleted. Mm -hmm. And so stress depletes your neurotransmitters. There's an actual pathway where cortisol upregulates the uh, expenditure of norepinephrine to epinephrine so that you can run away from that tiger, right? But you're not supposed to be running away from a tiger 24 seven. So this is depleting in the long run, which can then show up as, you know, first a lot of our patients, you know, stuff that wouldn't cause other people pain, but they're like, you know, just bending my fingers. I have pain, you know, there's like, you know, I'm walking, I have pain. But, you know, sometimes there's no actual physical or myofascial uh, root for the pain. 
it's like, what is it? Okay, it's neurochemical. I see. And that drives that sensitivity where normal movement is not so normal anymore. It's just, it's, maybe the movement's normal, but it doesn't feel normal. Exactly. Okay. Your sensation and experience of it is not normal. Okay. And so in the modern day world, we're running away from a tiger now is more or less like uh, responding to a mean tweet or running away from your boss or, um, you know, <laughs> chasing it fighting with your spouse i don't you know <laughs> right, all the other stuff modern day stuff right okay gotcha yeah yeah okay cool makes sense yeah the um it's the the stuff is tough because you're right it's so hard to be able to just shut it off or shut it down there it's like this perpetual cycle you mentioned i really like what you said about the symphony it's like instead of all of these musicians playing in concert they're all going rogue now and everything's mm -hmm. all haywire and it sounds like crap now, this is maybe too deep of a question, and it's probably very individualized, but do you have any, say, of like um, uh, very simple or, or helpful tips for most people where they can start to get those musicians to play together again? Absolutely. So one thing is getting your cortisol under control, right? So uh, one of the things, we're just rushing, 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 rushing. So simple things, just starting your day, two minutes in peace. And if you can, outside. There's studies that show that like just 10 minutes outside can help start to balance your cortisol levels. We're not meant to be so stimulated all the time. There's, there's a beautiful, you know, our physiologies have evolved with nature. And so the more modern we become, the more disconnected from nature we've become. And I know it always sounds woo-woo, but you know, there's a reason you feel good when you walk on the beach. There's a reason you feel good when you spend time outdoors. It's because there are hormonal changes that are happening in response to you being outside. So, you know, I would say go for 10 minutes, but you know, for some people that's not enough. They just can't fit that in their schedule. Do two minutes, start with whatever you can. Mm -hmm. Go outside, deep breathe. So when your exhale is longer than your inhale, Okay, you're activating what's called the parasympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system is rest and digest mode. And when you're in rest and digest mode, you can therefore heal, right? If you're constantly in fight or flight mode, you're never getting into the healing mode. You're never repairing your muscles. You're never repairing, you know, hormones. You're never repairing your mind. Nothing gets repaired. Awesome. I love that. We teach breathing quite a bit and usually- Yeah, I know you're big on it. Right. Mine usually is typically like core stability, but we know there's a relaxation component to it. And you know, that five, five, seven, nine breathing pattern, like that would be an example. Five, yeah, absolutely. Ten, ten, hold for seven, breathe out for nine. Now absolutely. I, that's a, it's a great technique. Now, is that something It's making me think about this? People will often say, well, you know, I don't have time for this or I'm trying to, or, you know, I try to go to bed earlier, but I can't fall asleep. So I'm still wound up. Is this type of breathing something people can use to be able to get to sleep, stay asleep? Absolutely. It's something that is not as immediate, I think. Like some, for some people, it can be immediate, but it's more you got to train your brain. Mm -hmm. Once you train your brain, then you're so much more resilient that, you know, that's why they call these practices, right? Because you have to practice and train the mind and the body to kind of work co like coherently. Once you do that, and then you're faced with another stressor, you will see that, my gosh, you're so much more stronger than you were before, like things that would have knocked you off your feet before, or you would have been irritated or whatever, you're able to handle much easier. So I would say if you can try to do it twice a day, you know, in the morning and in the evening, uh, if you can fit it in, in the afternoon too, it's just breathing. It's free. <laughs> Yeah, and if that's sure. not, if, if that's difficult for a lot of people, I know who are really uh, deficient in their neurotransmitters, it can be hard to try to breathe consciously. So then you might need a little bit of help, you know, with some herbs or nutritional supplements that can help in the time, meantime. And then once you're able to train yourself, then you can take all those supplements away. So as you know, uh, in my practice, I teach about breathing as well, but typically it's more regarding breathing for core stability. Right. We all know mm -hmm. breathing is mainly for oxygenation of the blood. We all get that. We're all good breathers because we're here. We're alive. Uh, but it's also for postural stability. It can be for relaxation, as you mentioned, bringing us down from a fight or flight to a rest and digest. I've given this like you know, a five, seven, nine breathing type pattern to people as like a way to sort of try and de-stress before going to bed because they say, you know, I know that I need to get more sleep. I'm stressed. But then the stress is so much I can't sleep. And it's this perpetual cycle. 
Um, as we know, sleep is so important. Other than the deep breathing like that, are there any other like helpful, easy tips someone can implement now that they can help them with sleep um, where they're maybe struggling with it because they're so stressed out? Absolutely. So, you know, not a lot of people think about this, but light exposure. It, like we are exposed to light way too long than we're supposed to be. So, you know, that is actually a stressor in itself because you're not having the hormonal changes, the neurotransmitter changes that should be happening when you have an absence of light. So again, it kind of goes back to that nature thing where our physiologies have evolved with nature. And when you're prolonging daylight, that is stressful. And so being aware of that, you know, in the evening time, starting to dim your lights, watching your blue light exposure, you know, if you can't, I get it. We live in the modern world. You still have to work. I still have to work sometimes in the evening, just kind of catching up on some stuff protect yourself with blue light blocking glasses. Uh, you know, they do. They do. Okay. There was a study I was just reading the other day, you know, it was a small study, but you know, it does have a statistical significance in terms of um, improving the quality of sleep and the subjective uh, uh, observation of their own sleep. Like mood is a little bit better. They feel a bit refreshed. They're sleeping a little bit longer. So yeah. even like two hours before bed, put on those blue light blockers so that you can really, really help yourself get that restorative sleep because sleep, as you know, is a drug. It is a drug. So it's not only for physical repair, but also mental and emotional repair, which can help with pain uh, perception. Yeah, everything is so important. And I know for me, as soon as I started optimizing or focusing on improving my sleep, going to bed earlier, staying in bed for at least eight hours and not like looking at my phone, it says, oh, you're going to be waking up in exactly seven hours. Well, that's seven hours in bed, not exactly good restorative sleep for seven hours. And I've noticed a lot of differences where I haven't changed any other parts of my life. But uh, I like hearing about the, the blue light blockers because you and I have talked about this. We get skeptical about products and devices, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got one of these things, but is this thing going to be the cure to your back pain? Absolutely <laughs> not, right? It's right. Good. So sometimes we get skeptical about that stuff. That's good to note because I get stuck in that too, where you have to be at home, you got to answer some emails or maybe finish a few notes and you're going to be on the computer watching TV and having that blue, reducing that blue light exposure is great. Uh, I know on my computer, I have the, the function where it takes the blue light out, right? Where it's the- Yeah. And I don't the, think they're good enough. If you okay. want me to be completely honest, I don't think those, the yeah. Flux app or whatever, I Flux, don't think yeah, they're exactly. good enough. Yeah. Well, it's good to know because I figured oh, I'm using the Flux thing would be fine. So maybe adding yeah. some light blockers- uh, yeah, helpful at the same time as using flux or even without flux. So, and you know, uh, the it's not only just from the electronics. You know, people's overhead lighting and their lamps That's that is also artificial light that is extending. Yeah, yeah so maybe we should starting to light. dim yeah. exactly start to dim it so that your body gets the signal because if you're not giving the body the signal to go to bed, you're not going to go to bed. <laughs> I see. So looking at your phone right before bed, you know, swiping through Instagram, YouTube, not a good Biggest no, no, biggest okay. no, no. <laughs> I gotcha. Yeah. Um, no, that's great advice because we all kind of know this stuff, but there's sometimes it's hard to implement. It's hard to break that cycle. Um, and it just becomes a perpetual cycle. We're like, oh, I know I should be doing this and I can't. These are helpful tips. What would you say to someone who's having a hard time maybe implementing these tips or sticking with them? I would say start slow and low, like just give yourself something you're going to be successful at. So whether that would be, you know, just in the morning time, just step out for a minute or like get to your car and then just stand there for a minute before you actually get in and then go to work. Start low and slow so that you set yourself up for success yeah. so that, you know, then, you know, the next week you can do two minutes, you know, outside or I'll just do 30 seconds of deep breathing. That's it. Start low and slow. You got to build trust with yourself. So right. just start low and slow. Don't go like I have a bad habit also like going completely gung ho and then I never do anything. For sure. And on the other side of the coin, what about the people that kind of blow this off? Like, oh, what's 30 seconds of breathing going to do? Well, you're just starting to train your brain. Yeah. So just look at it that way. You know, you're still doing something. For sure. For yeah. Sure. Well, yeah. Uh, one more question. Why not just take melatonin? Or take a pill. Ah, oh my gosh. Great question. Great question. So melatonin, though it's natural, uh, is, is good for just like short periods of time, like jet lag, or, you know, you've been traveling. A lot of us are not traveling right now. But the thing is, our body, again, works in feedback mechanisms. So if you look at melatonin is part of the serotonin pathway. 
And if you always give the end product melatonin, you're never going to go through the pathway of making serotonin. Serotonin is your happy chemical. It mm-hmm. makes, it helps with mood. It helps with sleep onset. So there have been association with long-term melatonin use is associated with depression, which makes sense. So be careful with over-the-counter supplements because just because they're natural does not mean they're like, if they're not used in the correct way, it can do more harm than good. I see. Okay. Makes sense. Because not going through the entire mechanism where it's kind of like, well, why eat food if you can just take individual supplements, right? There is a exactly. synergistic effect to it. And it's not just one, one cog in the system. And you, you, it's, it's, it's not, it's not holistic, I guess. Right. It's exactly using, it's not using the, the direct mechanism we use to make it. It's sort of hijacking it. It sounds like it may be a good short-term solution, but not long-term. No, because, and the other thing is like, Part of it is environmental for most of us with the, you know, the light exposure. And so you're keeping the lights on and then you're just popping melatonin. It's like work on the environment first. Right. I know as human beings, it's easy to go for that low hanging fruit like that and not have to take the hard path, which is making our change in ourselves. And which leads me to a, one of my, one of my favorite quotes. That's your quote. And I don't know if you get up from <laughs> somewhere else. It's when change becomes your lifestyle, it's life changing. And that's so true because we so often like don't want to like take the responsibility for whatever reason, maybe because it's too hard or maybe it's an ego thing, who knows, but it's easy to pop a pill, but you're right. It's hard to start implementing some habit change. But as you and I know, until you make some of those changes, you know, the reason why you have the problem in the first place is likely because it's something you're either doing or not doing the cause it, right? If we don't address those things, we're never going to get those long-term solutions. So I just want people to hear that is when change becomes your lifestyle, it's life changing. So start small, add these little changes, one thing at a time. Once you have that win, make another win. Measure the gains and not the gaps. Don't think about what you didn't do that day. Think about the little gains you had and then keep snowballing that. And I feel like that's where people can get the success. Absolutely. That's a great way. Think about the gains, not the gaps. I love that. Cool. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, Dr. Suira, I really appreciate you being on uh, 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 talking to our audience today. And let's do this very soon because I want to keep sharing yeah. information because you have a lot of stuff that I like to discuss with people briefly, but I always say like, hey, that's not my expertise. You got to talk to someone else about it. And I think you provide so much value that people can use and uh, let's just keep putting it out there. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Burr. I really appreciate it. Sounds good. Take care. Bye.